Hello, everybody. Welcome to a special interview with Sam Webster of actually of Afro Blue. I, if I remember correctly, is still using that channel name. <laughs> oh Christ, no! Um, that got well. It's still the channel name because I can't change the URL on YouTube. Um, but all of the stuff I can edit got changed to SJ Webster. It was like a um, college. All of my friends had a color. And then an object as their Xbox Live tags. I was like, oh, I'm just going to go with that and then use it everywhere. Uh, <laughs> it's a bad idea. <laughs> well, I, uh, you're in good company. I started out calling my, my channel literally, I love other people's misery. And but now I just changed it to the more <laughs> catchy title of Brett the Hitman with two T's. And yeah, it works. Wrestling fans will know what that's a reference to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <sighs> Poor old Owen having to watch that. Yeah. But yeah. So, for those of you listening to this, I called Sam in on this because as he was actually, he was looking for people to review his comic book, Unfamiliar Skies, which I read the first two issues of, and I think it's very excellent. So, oh, thank you. And seeing as how I also do stuff for WeAreWrittenSins.com, um, I decided, you know what? Might as well get an interview for this get with with this guy and put it up on the website. So I would probably give him a, some much needed exposure because you got to help out your indie creators, guys. No, absolutely. Um, but this way, I think the initial print runs for most of us don't go above two hundred for most books. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I've been I've been uh, if Scuttlebutt is to be believed, supposedly Marvel's has done so badly in sales it's actually feasible for an indie creator to match their sales it depends on the book so a lot of books used to get cancelled around about i believe it was a twenty thousand mark and now you only need about twenty five thousand to break into the top 100 selling comics of any month according to comicron which is insane <laughs> yeah. a lot of well a lot of information i know about what the comic industry is doing is coming from guys like diversity and comics and uh Captain Cummings and various other figures. Uh, I think Razor Fist is also a guy too, but diversity in comics I go to for the numbers. Mm. You, you familiar with those guys? Uh, no, not those ones particularly. A lot of people um, sort of talking about comics in general, thinking Marvel might you know, end up sending it out to someone else or sub-licensing it so they don't actually make the comics, but someone else does. I don't see that happening, but... Interesting, nonetheless. Yeah. Well, well uh, yeah, enough chit chat. Let's uh, let's get into the real meat of the video. So, Sam, how about you tell the good people listening a bit about yourself? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I'm Sam, um, 28, uh, father of two, um, designer by day and by evening slash weekend, an indie comic book artist, um, which has been about five years now. Um, and Unfamiliar Skies Issue 2 is my sixth book to have come out. Alright, um, so I guess the big question is, like, how exactly did you get into comics? Has this always been something you've been into since you were, like, a kid, or is this... Yeah, um, there's always been the background, and then there was, like, one specific event. So, like, as a kid, I used to get the Sonic the Hedgehog comics by Fleetway, and um, that featured the work of Richard Elson and Nigel Kitching. And those two teamed up. They were the dream team. They were fantastic. Uh, Richard's since gone on to do work for 2000 AD, Amazing Spider-Man, Incredible Hulk. Fantastic artist, sorely underrated. Um, and at the same time, I was playing the Sonic the Hedgehog video games. And that was right the way through to when the comics got cancelled. I'd have been about 10 or so. Um, and I sort of kept on with video games and like my dad was very much uh, well comics and games are all very good but you'll never get a degree out of them uh, fast forward a few years to me graduating with a bachelor's honors degree in video game art and design <laughs> <laughs> he, he sort of uh, yeah, swallowed hard on that one um, but admittedly then finding a job in either video game design or comics was extremely difficult, um, which my dad then held over me. He was like, oh, you got the degree, but you're not doing anything with it. And for a lot of years, he was right. Um, thankfully, the design day job came around eventually. But prior to that, I was sort of working dead end call center stuff. Um, 
I had my first kid on the way and I had done nothing. So a proper existential crisis sort of deal. Um, I went to, I'd been to a few conventions already, you know, for a few years. And I went to Melksham Comic Con, tiny little local town con, mostly independent artists. And there were two, uh, Nick Angel, who does Seven String, and John Locke, who does a book called After I Think, gave a panel. And they were there were two guys who were only a couple years older than me. They had day jobs, they had other halves, they had commitments. Um, but they had said, screw the excuses, made the time and put a comic together. Uh, and it was their enthusiasm. It was so infectious that I went home and I started doing character sketches for what turned out to be my first comic, Arcadia, that night. Um, so sort of like... The background was there, but it wasn't until there was that trigger moment. Oh, that's uh, that's a pretty good origin story right there. <laughs> a little long-winded, which I apologize for. <laughs> no, 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 it's good. That, 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 that's excellent. I mean, like, I mean, that's a, that is something I can I can pretty well sympathize with. Like, I got a degree in marketing and. Still have yet to do something with it. My dad, on the other hand, has been a bit more optimistic, saying, "You know what? You'll never know when that actually will come in handy." Mm. And all the while, I can reinforce that. Like the design day job, sort of just happened. The company I was working for, with the call center stuff, advertised an internal only position, uh, which I went for and and got. So it, it can surprise you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that, that, that's, that's really, that's actually really good. That's, uh, and yeah, I mean, like, as far as cons go, I mean, like, uh, yeah, you said it was like a small con. Like, how, like, are we talking like a few hundred people at most? Yeah, we're talking maybe 30 tables, and I think that number's through the door was somewhere around four or five hundred. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, the, we got a con out here in Tacoma called Jet City Comic Con that's, probably about the size of it too the big con out in washington is emerald city up in seattle uh, okay i always see it advertised never been able to obviously get out to the u.s to actually go to that one but um oh that would be the dream <laughs> uh, i'm not sure you'd want to go to i'm not sure you'd want to go to san diego comic-con these days it's just these days it's just advertising for te for tv shows that sounds a lot that sounds a lot like MCM. We get that like every time any of us Brits go on the American boards or Facebook groups, and like San Diego is this, this, and this. Like, yeah, that's pretty much MCM over here, which does like the big London show and stuff. Really? They are it, it's video games, movies, sci-fi, and in this dank, dark corner over here, we've got some comic books. <laughs> Hey, does anyone remember when comic book conventions were actually about comic books? Now there is a discussion topic that we could be on literally all night. <laughs> yeah. I mean, oh, damn it, dude. I mean, like, what the? Uh, I don't want to lose the plot here. That's okay. Yeah, that, that, that would, that would, uh, yeah. So, I uh, how my next question was going to be, like, how long have you been doing this? But you kind of already answered that earlier, saying you've been doing this for about, like, what, five years? Yeah, um, so just in between, obviously, day job, family commitments, etc. So it's been averaging sort of a book every nine months or so, which I'm I'm trying to get better at. I've actually written a timeline now to try and schedule it in. Um, but yeah, it was um, a one-shot called Arcadia to test the waters where everybody in town had all of their video game consoles stolen on the same night. Um, it's out of print now, so spoilers, it was a local arcade owner. Uh, figured if they couldn't get their fix at home, they would come and plug quarters in at his arcade. Um, so a little bit of Scooby-Doo, but with some fucks and shits thrown in. Uh, <laughs> that actually sounds like it'd be... That actually sounds like it'd be hilarious. I mean, I'm hoping you've at least got the like the original print or something. So like, if you could probably publish oh, yeah. that, publish that as a bonus to an, as to a future book or something. You know, like you know, like back in the day when like uh, Marvel would package like several books into hmm. would package like a uh, well snippets of new titles like in their main comic book. Yeah, and the good news on that front is that the digital copy is on Comicsology. 
Um, and I do have, I keep all of the original files. I'm uh, a stickler for, and I don't know if this is the day job where I've seen it happen too many times or what, but off-site backups, get a Dropbox, get a Google Drive, and then get something else as well, because you're going to need them one day or the other. And then the other thing, which is a little bit vain, I'm going to have to move the camera to really show it, um, is that I do sort of above my workstation, I've got like my degree and the comics I've released so far. And then Unfamiliar Skies, I've had to move to the other... Oh, that doesn't show it too well. But the other wall is Unfamiliar Skies because I ran out of space on this one. Yikes. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, that's that's pretty sound advice. Keep backups of the backups. Oh, yeah, and, like, even to the point of do the Dropbox or Google Drive and such, but I also have a couple of friends I regularly send files to, so it's on their computers, and I have a USB stick that I carry around with me, which is about 64 gig capacity, which has just dumped everything onto. Is it paranoia at its best. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I guess the next, uh, I guess the next logical question would be like, who would you cite as your main influences as a creator? Um, definitely Richard Elson, um, who actually to me is, they say don't meet your heroes, the nicest guy you could ever hope to meet, seriously. Um, outside of that, I had a well, I still do have a big manga phase going on. Um, so Akira Toriyama from Dragon Ball, uh, how he does like torsos and biceps in particular, I, I pretty much just rip off wholeheartedly uh, <laughs> and unashamedly. Well, um, that's, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Like, uh, I remember catching this one interview with Phil Anselmo from Pantera, and his advice to young musicians was rip off 20 of your favorite artists, just rip them off, and somewhere in the mix, you'll figure out your style. Yeah, it works. It really does. Um, so you got uh, Toriyama, and then for, like, I got into DC around about the time Batman had just died. Um, well, died in commas in Final Crisis. And uh, that led me to Red Robin by Marcus Toe, who is, like, his economy of line art is sublime. He knows exactly how much he needs to convey something. There is not a single wasted line in his work. Um, it's it, fantastic to see his run recently on Nightwing as well because he's not been forgotten. Um, and then other than that, like anything that has Ed McGuinness's name on it, again, bold, crisp lines. These guys have a certain confidence about them. Like respect to Jim Lee, but you know when you see all the lines and the cross hatching and everything else, you sort of think, well, if you make a mistake, you've got a hundred ways to sort of cover that over or brush it to one side. Um, manga artists, people like Toe, McGuinness, and um, Elson, obviously, over this side of the pond, uh, they all are pretty much, here's the work, if there's a mistake, it will be blindingly obvious, but we're not going to make mistakes. Uh, and it's just this powerful statement of, here it is. You got to admire it. Yeah, yeah, I mean, like, guys who can guys who can do who work that good, that consistently, uh, that is definitely to be admired, and I think I even remember hearing something about, uh, was someone, it was someone I had a, someone I had a conversation with randomly on, back when I had a DVNR account I don't anymore, because fuck that site, right? <laughs> <laughs> but this, but this person was talking about a time, like, they had met Eric Larson, and how he was, like, able to draw a whole page, panels, backgrounds, everything, like, I think like in under an hour or something. It was very quick. It was very quick. That's all I can say. And I That's like, an insane speed. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, Absolutely insane. Yeah, like, but I'm just saying, I mean, like, guys who are that, who have spent that much time honing their craft and have gotten that good at it. And I mean, like, I have, I mean, like, I have issues with Eric Larson as a person, but his artistic merit is, it's self-evident, even if he is kind of coasting on his legacy a bit. Sometimes you have to sort of, to enjoy a comic, you sort of have to take the creator's personality and the politics out of it a bit yeah. and just, you know, look at the work that's there rather than, you know, who they voted for, yeah. how they've talked to people, etc. Yeah. yeah, I know, but I mean, like, 
Yeah, that thing I can take or leave, but I mean, I think, like, uh, biggest criticism I've heard level against Eric Larson is that his, just, his work just hasn't really evolved since the 90s. Ah, uh, okay, so, sort of, second verse, same as the first sort yeah. of story. Yeah, that's yeah. But yeah, I mean, but, yeah, but, uh, I would assume the guys you're following, like, their their guys have only gotten better with time. Oh yeah, every time I see, like, I've been reading through the trade of the Black Vortex, which is uh, Guardians, X-Men, Nova, and McGuinness has work in that that is absolutely outstanding. Um, and like the recent Marcus Toe run on Nightwing was just, they paired him with a colorist I've not seen him with before, and it just put the whole piece in a new light. So yeah, these are guys who, have, best thing you can say about these guys, they have not gotten stale. Oh no, they keep up in their game. It's incredible. All right. So, with uh, with that, I guess the logical segue would be, what was the inspiration behind Unfamiliar Skies? Um, specifically a poem. Um, Carl Sagan's Pale Blue Dot, um, which actually I came across through a, an album by the band Story of the Year. Uh, they use samples of it in that, and it, it's this feeling of, you know, you're one person on a planet of, you know, seven billion in a solar system of seven or eight planets. I forget if Pluto's still a planet or it's not. not. Rick and Morty Damn said it. so. <laughs> <laughs> well, then it must be true. <laughs> but, you know, and then you count, that's revolving around one star, which is of trillions of stars and just this sort of, feeling of being utterly insignificant and Carl Sagan's pale blue dot talks a lot about um you know how people have committed genocide um done all these atrocious acts for uh, what's really control over a fraction of a dot and the the amount of time they're alive to have that control is like the blink of an eye in the grand scheme of things uh and it's sort of this almost a crushing hopelessness which ties into the existential crisis feelings I was having way back, even with Arcadia. However, it's a different spin on it in that those feelings went away when um, I saw, obviously, my kids be born, and you're looking at the amount of infinite potential there, and you're looking at, you know, um, they're a blank slate. They don't know anything. Anything they want to do or achieve, they're going to have to learn and practice and do on their own. Uh, and actually, every human started out that way. So no matter who your idol is or or what have you, you can achieve it too. Combined with sort of every little action and every little choice, like I think about choices like uh, going to my first ever Comic Con where I met uh, <laughs> the woman I'm now marrying. You know, ten years on, um, who's you know the mother of those kids, and that all spiraled out of one decision to turn around to a friend at uni and go. Yeah, screw it. We'll go to a comic con. Why not? Um, you know, it's, it's sort of just the amount of impact that you can have on the world around you, um, despite being so insignificant. And trying to take that journey and project it onto a character. Um, so, Claris, uh, this, uh, we're talking a bit big scope. So, to narrow it down, Claris is 19. She's been born on a space colony. Um, not the life she picked. Um, by the time the ship she's on reaches its destination, she'll have died. It won't be her that gets there. It won't be her grandkids that get there. Um, and she's like, no, not for me. Um, you know, I'm not here just to breed and, and pass on this mission I didn't sign up for. So she blasts off like a rebellious teenager running away from home. And actually, she's not got a plan and she doesn't know where her place in the universe is. And she's confronted with just how much is out there um and right now issues one and two she's you know impulsive she's rebellious she's going you know purely on instinct it's a whirlwind of emotion um but she will grow from that into a more mature well-rounded character that you know her experiences are going to shape her and show her where she should be that's uh... Boom! I just that just floored me. That's, that's that's fucking amazing, dude. I mean, like, I mean, like, just the the impact the impression I got off the first two issues. She was now me. I'm 
you know, me, I'm kind of a guy who likes to have ev like the whole package so I can have a more complete picture, sure, so I can really yeah. collect my thoughts. But just on the first impression, I mean, like, this is not going to be a predictable ride. Like, the fact that, I mean, like, I thought the whole story was going to be about her looking for her dad from the first issue, and the fact that she finds him an issue, too, this tells me, yeah, things are not going to play out the way you think they will just when you think you've figured it out book pulls the rug yeah. out from under you and says uh -uh. and in fact it seems more like it's going to show like all the ripples that her that her choices and actions are going to have throughout the story and mm. we've seen the the start of one of those ripples at the end of issue two um and not to give spoilers but uh, there is a revenge act at the end of issue two which is from her actions in issue one so, so yeah, like I said, uh, say what you will, this book will not be predictable, which is great, and it's at least it's at least gotten my attention, and I'm genuinely interested to see where it goes because eh, I haven't yeah, been good, able to yeah. that. So um, there is a certain amount of fluidity as well. Um, so I've marked out like the key points. You know, they need to be here at this time. Uh, these people are marked for death. Uh, these are key characters that will appear later. Um, but how it goes from A to B, I've left myself a little wiggle room, and even in the scripts for issues one and two, things have changed and developed a little over time. Um, so while the main beats, I know, um, there's always the room to play with it and have fun with it as well. I mean, like, I'm actually kind of I'm a fan of that kind of storytelling. Story allows things to... Uh, things to uh, a bit of an echo. No, I'm not catching an echo. Oh, must be. All right, maybe it's just me. But yeah, uh, I'm a I'm a fan of that kind of storytelling. It allows things to fold out a lot, play out more naturally. Things don't feel as yeah. forced. Things don't feel as processed. Says things don't feel as predictable. And at the extreme end of the spectrum, you had uh, Toriyama when he was writing Dragon Ball openly admitting that he didn't actually have a plan from week to week, um, which is way, way, way the other end of the spectrum. But that ended up being regarded as one of the best pieces of narrative media <laughs> ever. I mean, like, uh, somehow he made it work, I guess. Mm. But then again, like, of course, the Dragon Ball's just... It's over the top and outlandish, so you're not really going to question much of what goes on in it anyway. That's true. Once you start with a, a monkey boy and a transforming pig, you can sort of go anywhere and people will go along with it. Yeah. yeah. Pretty much, yeah. But yeah, it's, uh, but yeah, like I said, like that seems to be a good. Str that seems to be one of the strengths Unfamiliar Skies has, is that it's not going to be predictable. Yeah, it's. Um... It's one of these weird things where, because it's a, a mash of genres, it's not being written for a particular person outside of me. Um, so I'm not... Because, and part of the freedom of indie is that you know that you, you're going to be doing it as a hobby. You know that, you know, the money-wise, it might pay for itself and that's about it, unless you get, like, Brian Lee O'Malley levels of lucky. Um so that actually affords you a lot of freedom because you can put the art ahead of the sales. You know, you're writing for what the story needs rather than what a shareholder needs, if that makes sense. Uh, well, con well, considering who owns Marvel and DC, that's probably not too far off. Yeah. <laughs> uh, although even I would, although even I would say someone like the. <clears throat> <laughs> Mid-tier publishers, guys like IDW and Dynamite, even they're sort of beholden to a bottom line. Mm. Even Image is, look, it's creator-owned and you can do what you want within reason. And it's that within reason caveat. Yeah, yeah. yeah. all about the money, y'all. Uh, yeah. Exactly. But yeah. but yeah, speaking as an indie creator, what would you say your experience has been like? It's... Um... Two very different experiences. So on the side of, you know, meeting other creators, um, everyone has been incredibly welcoming. It's the most open community I've ever known. Um, you know, people will, you know, say hi to you. People go around, they buy each other's books. You know, it's a community where, for example, in the game development community, I would not share 
uh, untagged resources or code or, uh, you know, preview builds that are open source because they get stolen. Um, now, in the comic community, uh, if I've got, you know, want someone to take a glance over a page, see if it's working okay, um, I'll send them the print resolution version of the page. I'll send them the PSD quite happily in the knowledge that they're not going to, you know, run off or do anything with it. There's a certain level of trust with other creators um, that I've just not known in in any other hobbies, if that makes sense. Um, like with issue two specifically, um, a hair color changed on the back of feedback from someone who was reading the pages as I was drawing them. Uh, a fight scene got completely re-choreographed. Um, a, a starry sky background, which someone felt was too saturated and distracting, got toned down. Um, there were loads of little changes that were only possible because um, that community is there. Uh, with particular shout-outs to Vince Hunt from The Red Mask from Mars, uh, Tony Esmond from uh, neveriononything.blogspot.com, um, Sarah Harris, who uh, isn't a creator but is a friend to the indie community, uh, and my other half, uh, my long-suffering other half. Um, and like the best, the best moment of a convention is sort of like when it hits 7 p.m., you pack up, and everyone's like, right, pub, because that food and that but it, that beer, you will have the most incredible conversations and the most fun time. That you know, you can go to a con and make a loss. You'll have a fantastic weekend because of the other creators. Um, so on that side, it's incredible. Um, on the on the side of the general public, uh, largely in the UK, uh, the average consumer just doesn't get it. Uh, like you get the same questions time and time again, like, uh, oh, you drew this? And it's almost like now I've actually had people put wallets away once they find out that this isn't a company. This is a one man operation. They're like, oh, oh, this is homemade. Oh, OK. And they saw, <laughs> it's like, well, you, it's all a comic. Um, but it, you know, like the public, you can be talking to a guy dressed as Captain America, you know, doing the usual patter at your table, and they'll tell you they don't read comics. They're dressed as Captain Frickin' America at Comic-Con. They don't read comics. Um, Losers. Uh, yeah, you get a lot of, like, we watch the movies or we're fringe interested, and they're mainly there for, like, to pay a tenor to sit in a really cheap replica of the throne from Game of Thrones, you know. Um, <laughs> I would, so my Snyder comment was correct. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Um, yeah, I mean, you just you try to convert as many as you can, um, and you sell okay to the hardcores, you know. Yeah, that's uh, that's pretty. That's a pretty good summation. Um, Okay, so next question. What would you have to say to anybody who wants to get into comic books? Um, depending on your reasons for doing so, maybe don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, like if, you, if you want this to replace your job, um, keep your job, start it up as you know something as a hobby, something you do at weekends and evenings. And for a few people, it takes off. For a few people, it becomes their job. Um, however, you know, like you go to say MCM Comic Village where there's 220 small press tables over in the dank corner, um, and out of those 220 people, uh, maybe 10 of them are doing it full time. You know, the other 210 are part time hobbyists, whatever you want to call it. Um, so it is, it's the rare few, and those few are doing, you know, 17 hour days every day. Um, they are attached to their social media permanently. It's like fused into their being. Um, it's, I think, because I've seen people get in and then very quickly get out because what they think it's going to be and what it is are two very different things and you have to treat it like gambling. Uh, do not spend more than you are willing to lose. Like if you need that money for rent, do not spend it on a print run. Pay the rent. <laughs> Wait until you've got the money for a print run or do a Kickstarter for the print run. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, pretty much. I mean, like, like, but because that actually sounds about right. Because 
I've had a, I've tried to break into Kaos a couple times. Both mm. to, the, all of them have sort of failed to sort of take off. But I'm so I've sort of gotten to the point where you know what? Screw this. I'm well. It's <laughs> like I've it's it's not that I've given up. It's more like I've had it's kind of failed just because I've had people who couldn't make good on their who couldn't make good on commitments. So I decided you know what? I'll just do it myself. But I'm also struggling to yeah. struggling to with money at the moment. I mean, I'm actually hoping to transition to a better paying job right now, so hopefully I can make that more feasible. And I'll just say, you know, like, if I'm just going to do it myself, so that way I can at least say it got done. And, but yeah, yeah gonna, absolutely. Yeah, if you're I think do, if, you're going to, if you're going to do it as a partnership, the only ones I've seen work are the ones where the guys working on it really are best friends, if that makes sense. Um, or at least they're getting paid. Or are getting paid, yeah, but even then, I've seen too many horror stories of people like, oh, I paid this artist and they ran off, or oh, I did this work for this writer and then they never printed it, or, you know. Well, yeah, that's, so yeah, I mean, like, that sounds about right, but yeah, uh, but yeah, I mean, like, if you're going to do this, you got to want it badly, like, you've got to be, you got to be committed. You've either got to want it really, really bad, or you have to have realistic expectations. Yeah. Like, you have to be okay with the possibility that it might never take off. Yeah. 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 Well, like I said, I mean, like, if this, if the sales figures I have seen is anything to go by, it's, it's feasible for guys like us to actually match sales with Marvel now. Well, Marvel currently uh, make more revenue from a single Marvel Universe film um than they do from their entire year of comics their entire line for 12 months does not generate even close to a single one of their movies yeah that is that is very true especially with uh, now this would be this would be a whole other can of worms but the the administration <laughs> that's running marvel currently like they've just they've really done a lot of damage to like they've really alienated their fan base well, what could you be talking about? <laughs> oh, make my milkshakes, perhaps? <laughs> oh, I'm not a mouse with a dog called Pluto. <laughs> I'm going to stop doing that now. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, but yeah, I mean, the, the people who are in, like, uh, the people who are running Marvel right now, like, mainly the people Axel Alonso has under, under his, uh, he has under his wing like mm. they're just they really don't seem to like the fans and it's like they like they actively seem to despise them like they want it and they want to inject all these far left politics that aren't wanted that the books don't need and he and the fans don't like it and they're just saying fuck you you don't know what you want uh, I see it like a, um, speaking as a Sonic fan, we have this whole, you know, classic Sonic and modern Sonic issue, wherein um, you've got, like, the people who grew up with the Mega Drive games who are like, ah, oh, Sonic's not been good since Sonic and Knuckles, with an exception for Sonic Mania, because that was awesome. Um, and then you've got people, you know, born when really the only choice they had was Sonic Heroes and onwards. Um, and they're sort of like, uh, yeah, the old games don't really gel with me, but we love the new games um, and modern Sonic. And everyone just sort of agrees that Sonic Adventure is somewhere in the middle. Um, but like Sega are now in this position where they can't please both the classic and modern Sonic fans at the same time. They just can't do it. And I see Marvel in something of the same position because they're doing Marvel Legacy right now uh, to try and go back to the old school fans, you know, the fans who... Um, you know, remember Steve Rogers as Captain America, Tony Stark as Iron Man, you know, very, very set in stone. Um, but they've also got this new wave of fans they generated with Ms. Marvel, with Miles Morales, Spider-Man, you know, and um, the whole ethnicity and diversity pledge, which while I think equality, diversity and ethnicity has its place, especially in this day and age. The way that Marvel went about it was very forced, very ham-fisted, and very insincere. It came off not like they were doing it for the right reasons. It came off as a marketing stunt. It was very plain to see, and that's why people didn't connect with it, I feel, because they were like, well, 
you're not doing this because that's right for the characters. You're doing this because you want an easy buck. That's that sounds about right, and well, hasn't really paid off for them because now they're. I think. Well, I've got the Sonic problem. They've got a split fan base. Like um, four figures now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and there's this weird thing where I think a lot of people's, uh, people say they want something. They don't always put their hand in their pocket, get their wallet out and buy it. Uh, it's a focus testing problem. You know, you focus test people on coffee. People say they want a rich, dark roast because that's what society's taught them men want when what they actually buy at the store is something a lot milkier. Um and, you know, so you ask people questions, you don't always get honest answers, so... Uh, would you be up for, you know, an Asian Superman? Yeah, sure, absolutely, I'm all for an Asian Superman. That book hits the shelves, as DC found out recently, and people don't buy it. <laughs> Go fig. Although I would say at least DC seems to be a bit more on the ball with what they're doing like they're at least figuring out it's better for them to zig where marvel's zagging mm, it's two different approaches for sure and it's certainly playing out in dc's favor right now yeah. yeah although i mean like not to bring up razor fist again but like he seems to <laughs> he says that a lot of what's wrong with marvel you can trace back to mark wade with his daredevil run which admittedly was terrible I don't know, I've not read a whole lot of, of Daredevil. Um, I'm not familiar with the run, to be completely honest, but it's, yeah, um, yeah I always read more DC. Um, not entirely sure why, but... Yeah. Hey, everyone's got, everybody's got their camp and they stick with it. There's nothing wrong with that, I think. I mean, that's good. I mean, like, it's, I mean, like, uh, there was this joke aside review from the that I came across it was from uh, it was from a documentary on the 2003 Daredevil movie. And then right. I hold that against it, by the way. <laughs> but what Joe Casada said, like, was like during the 90s, there was the whole thing with the amalgam comics. There was sort of this detente between Marvel and DC, and he, and in his opinion, like the books that were coming out from that were a little bit on the lame side, like. <laughs> It's just the stuff like the um, the Captain America, Superman, and the uh, the Dark Claw that was Wolverine and Batman. That stuff, yeah. Yeah, like is in his in his own words, like he said, <clears throat> what was what made comics great was that you belonged to one camp and they fought with each other. You either were a DC kid or a Marvel kid, and that's and that competition drove people to put their best work forward. Hmm. So in the same sense, uh, you know, console wars, you were Nintendo or you were Sega, and very rarely was anyone both. Exactly. Exactly. With, or, in, or with wrestling, you were either WWF or WCW. <laughs> and we all know how that ended. Well, that, that was, that was, that was a reasons due to bad business practices from one side. But yes, but, mm. but I mean, like, there's some truth to that. I mean, like, you have, that competition drives people to to be their best. Oh yeah, because you've got to you've got to be one upping the other guy constantly. Yeah. Just seems like right now Marvel doesn't seem to be taking that that seriously, and DC's capitalizing on it because they're dominating with comic books. I disagree. I think they are taking it seriously. I think the problem might be that they're trying too hard. They're coming across from casual observations uh, right now, especially with this Marvel Legacy, which feels like a U-turn. Um, they're coming across a bit clawing and desperate to me, whereas DC feel a little bit more reserved and confident. It's all like DC are like, okay, we've got our formula. We're going to stick to it for now. And Marvel are like, this isn't working. Try something else. This isn't working. Try something else. Now that's not working. Try something else. And it's sort of... They're throwing yeah, everything at the like wall to see what sticks, basically. Exactly. <laughs> Which, I'm not a business major, and even I can tell you that's a terrible idea. Because you're just going to end up spending too much and make too little back. Yeah, they see tiny little spikes when they do these things, but it soon drops off very, very quickly. And we see, you know, books cancelled uh, before they're even six issues in. They are not prepared to sit something out for the long run. Well, 
law of econ economics will get will probably kick them in the ass sooner or later. Yeah. Yeah. Just as long as they don't take the rest of us down with them. <laughs> yeah. Although, from, although I mean, I am kind of encouraged by the by the Kickstarter crowd. I mean, like my boss over written since published a book called and and they call us monsters, which is sort of like this. Uh, it's sort of like a take on. <clears throat> It's sort of a take on Golden Age, Age Universal monsters, but there's like kind of a little bit of a twist to it. It's a little, it's interesting. Like it sort of tries to views it from their side, make them more seem more sympathetic. So like Kaiju Max. I, I guess I'm not familiar with that, but I'll take your word for it. <laughs> it's uh, it's Godzilla type monsters in a Supermax prison. It, again, plays up the sympathy for the monsters. Like, a lot of them are there just for being monsters. That actually sounds pretty cool. I will have to check that out. But yeah, there's... And of course, I've also heard, like, uh, how familiar are you with Bon Destiné? Oh, that's a new one on me. Franco-Belgian comics. Oh, okay. European stuff I have not looked at much. We get translations of European stuff, but it's mostly digital and comicsology. Um, you don't seem to have a lot on bookshelves. I mean, I'm, I'm a physical guy. <laughs> From what I've heard, though, like, Bond Destiny, like, makes, like, it makes bank. Like, there are stores out in, like, in France and Belgium that are mm. comic book stores, and they are, like, two stories high. Ah, uh, I'd love to see them. <laughs> It'd be so good just to go and spend everything. <laughs> yeah, and then, and then, of course, like, manga's still, like, I mean, like, even though Japan's got its own financial issues, manga's still fairly profitable. Oh, yeah, One Piece is selling millions and millions per volume. Yeah, in fact, it's, it's, all, it's only grown bigger and bigger over the years, in fact, if I remember correctly. Yeah, that snowball's got to stop eventually. <laughs> it's crazy. Oh, man, imagine... I can only imagine the pressure our Ichiro Oda's feeling, feeling with the end. Like, he's... Like, there is, like, no way he can... I mean, could even make an ending that will live up to that hype. If I remember correctly, he was the manga artist whose schedule got leaked onto the internet. And it was like three hours sleep a night, and then there was one hour on a weekend to spend with his wife. And the rest of the schedule was drawing manga. <laughs> I even remember hearing that he had an ad for assistance where he said the assistant must be ready to die for One Piece, and he is not being hyperbolic about it. Oh no, he means it, yeah. <laughs> but they their work ethic, they take it to a whole nother level. Yeah, I mean like I've actually read I've actually read somewhere online that there are cases where people in Japan have actually have literally worked themselves to death. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely that insanely dedicated, but you would I you could never do it. Ever. <laughs> never. No, that's just like, dude, that is just that is way too much of a I even remember hearing that uh, the guy who drew Naruto, like, he didn't take his honeymoon until 11 years after he got married. Jeez. That is one patient wife. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, Jesus. I mean, these, I mean, Jesus, these, the way they work those guys, guys that's insane. I mean, hey, all for that sweet, sweet royalty money. I, I'm, yeah, I'm not denying it. I'm, although, from what I hear, like manga artists get paid, unless you're like one of the really big names in the field, you are you're gonna be living like a pauper if you try to mm. make it as a manga artist. I mean, you think making it as a comic book artist is tough? Try making it as a manga artist. Yeah, it's supposedly a case of the pay rate is terrible, but if you do reasonably well then the royalties and you know your cut of the profits especially from the international translations and, and such that's what sees you for it so basically um, if you don't have a manga that becomes an anime you're fucked yeah you either and this is covered a little actually in the manga bakuman which is about making manga <laughs> It's if you've not checked it out, I highly recommend it. It's uh, Abata. I, I know of it. Yeah, I've, I've never actually read it, but yeah, I, I'm I'm aware of it. Yeah, and they actually say in there that like you are either a lifetime gambler um, or you get a smash hit, um, and you know that's it. You're set. It's one or the other. You don't really fall in the middle. <laughs> 
Okay, well, uh, I think, the, I think we've sort of taken this as far as we can. Sam, do you have anything you want to plug? Um, Christ, do I have anything I want to plug? Uh, yes, a friend of mine has a Kickstarter up right now. Um, so Rachel Smith, UK comic artist. Um, the book is called Wired Up Wrong Deluxe Edition. Uh, and it's all about her battles with, you know, anxiety, depression, that sort of thing. But it's not a downer. It's actually really funny and lighthearted. And, like, you, it will leave you with a grin on your face. Um, I checked earlier this afternoon. She's nearly at her £6,000 goal. Um, but if you go kickstar.com, search for Wired Up Wrong, it'll be there. Um, uh, one other thing for people to definitely check out would be um, the Awesome Comics podcast. So it's a weekly podcast uh, by Vince Hunt, who does The Red Mask from Mars, Dan Butcher, who does Vanguard, a free uh, superhero indie webcomic, and uh, Tony Esmond, who does a lot of comic reviewing in the UK. Um, and they are sort of two hours every Monday. It gets me through, you know, the first day back at work after a weekend. Um, fantastic fun. Uh, outside of that, there's obviously my books, which you can find at sjwebster.bigcartel.com. Um, and also all of my books are available on Comixology. So if you go to Comixology, um, search for either Arcadia, Joe Cape, or Unfamiliar Skies, and you'll find me. I guess we go without saying your YouTube channel. Oh, yes. Um, the YouTube channel's in a funny spot at the moment um, because my my comics persona and uh, my video game persona, they, they're not really coexisting right now. They're sort of fighting for the same limited free time. Um, it's like video game reviews and comic book reviews on YouTube are sort of going up once every three months or so when it used to be every couple of weeks. Um, I think it might reach a point where it becomes one or the other and comics will probably win that fight. But while I'm still doing them, uh, you can find them at youtube.com forward slash AFR0BLU3. All right. So yeah, I'll be sure to include all the links in the description for this, for this interview, guys. So, yep. Sam, thanks for stopping by. No problem. Thanks for having me.